Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. This is great. It's full house here for our second lecture of the semester. I'm Dean Michael Scharf. Um, on behalf of the law school, the Cox International Law Center, the faculty, we are very happy to see so many students and graduates and people from throughout the university and the community here for what is going to be a wonderful lecture. This law school has had some amazing people speak from this podium, three of which in the last 10 years have been from South Africa, two in the past and one today. We've had Albie Sachs, who is a historic figure in anti-apartheid. We had Richard Goldstone, uh, a constitutional court judge and also the first um, prosecutor of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda Tribunal from South Africa. And today we are blessed to have our partner and colleague, Lawrence Juma, the Deputy Dean of Rhodes University Faculty of Law, who is going to be talking to you about the African relationship with the International Criminal Court, a topic that has been much in the news, and we are just really, really thrilled, Lawrence, that you have come to speak to us today. So please join me in a warm Case Western Reserve welcome for Lawrence Juma. Well, it's a bit uh, overwhelming to, to know that um, those great people have been to your school uh, speaking to you. Um, Mike, thanks for wonderful introduction. Um, I don't usually like being referred to, uh, being introduced as dean, uh, because then people begin to think of me as an administrator and not so much of a scholar. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, it's a little bit unsettling. Um, uh, thank you very much, too, for um, welcoming me to your school. And um, I really do want to sincerely thank you for the wonderful welcome. Uh, you, Nancy, Sarah, and everybody else that I've met since I've been here. Uh, and, and Mike, the barbecue in your house was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, the trip down to Chautauqua, uh, New York, and wonderful deliberations there with the prosecutors of international tribunals, um, and um, lunch uh, discussions today, and uh, meeting with Sarah, and discussions with some of the students who might want to take advantage of the exchange program. Uh, that my school and your school have set up. Um, uh, that was wonderful too. And I do hope that um, uh, some students will come down to South Africa for a semester uh, with us. Uh, we also hope to send a few of our students to spend some time with you here too. And uh, we would like to extend it to staff as well. And we hope that uh, it will be a beginning of a very, very wonderful relationship between us uh, and you. Um, it is indeed a privilege for me to speak uh, and share with you some of my thoughts on this uh, very controversial subject uh, where everybody has something to say. Um, but um, before I do that, uh, I would like to invite you to reflect for a moment uh, some of the problems that we have in this world in which we live in and um, how we view uh, friends, neighbors, and people who we consider uh, to be of a different identity uh, from us. Uh, since I've been here, about five people have asked me when I'm going back. <laughs> uh, some in the hotel, uh, and some whom I meet in social places. Uh, the, once you speak funny, uh, the next thing that people ask you is, oh, oh you're visiting. Um, when are you going back? Um, the idea of otherness um, is quite rampant in our world. They might not mean something sinister with it, uh, but the question of identity is, is something that is uh, problematic uh, uh, in the world today. And uh, we fear people who we perceive as uh, different from us, um, and um, in some places, um, 
that you know about, uh, the identity crisis and conflicts that arise out of uh, the fear of the other has led to armed conflicts and armed uh, and violent confrontation. And in some places, in some countries, uh, those kinds of confrontation and violence defines the entire structure uh, of the political and social life of people. Uh, and um, in those circumstances, uh, human rights violations, uh, atrocities of all kinds, uh, perpetrated against people who are most vulnerable, and sometimes to obtain political mileage. And people are killed, maimed, displaced, and a great deal of suffering is visited on people. Unfortunately, not many people who are responsible uh, for these kinds of atrocities are held to account. Uh, because they happen to be the political leaders, uh, persons of great influence and authority. So, in some of these regions, uh, from one regime to another, um, atrocities are committed and people have no recourse. People are not being held to account for them. Um, in many countries in Africa, where I come from, election seasons are always uh, periods of great anxiety. Uh, those who follow events in Kenya, for example, know that uh, the post-election violence of 2008, uh, where women and children uh, were locked in churches and torched, um, people were displaced from uh, their residences. Um, election periods are periods of violence. Now those who are responsible for these kinds of violence are the political leaders. And holding them to account within those places or within those countries has become something of a challenge. And you can name many countries in Africa today uh, where election periods are periods of violence. Uh, Burundi, most recently, Lesotho, almost the entire city of Maseru was burnt down in 1998 after the election period. Uganda, where whenever there is an attempt to oust the current president, um, there are always problems. And right now, as we are talking, the opposition leaders, some of them are in jail, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and many other places. So as periods change, as election, election seasons come and go, uh, the circle of impunity also repeats itself. Now, the world has responded to these situations in numerous ways, and um, we students of international law know some of this. The efforts to establish a framework for ending impunity based on the United Nations um, uh, sponsored criminal tribunals is something that we have lived with now for a few decades. You are no doubt familiar with these tribunals, and uh, the subsequent developments that led to the establishment of the permanent court, uh, the International Criminal Court, um, is something that we, we are well aware of. Now, a lot has been written about these developments and how we, uh, we got to where we are today. So I will not spend too much uh, on that. And whether the court has delivered or not delivered is also a matter of lots of discussion today, uh, some of which uh, I was a party to at Chautauqua in a few days ago. So the subject of my talk today is on a related subject, uh, that of exploring the relationship between the court and African states. Bluntly, I ask the question whether African states will withdraw from the ICC, uh, given the rhetoric of political leaders uh, led by their umbrella organization, the African Union. Now, why do I ask this question? I do so because, in my view, there is apparent discord between the external policy agenda that is espoused by our political leaders and the seemingly grounded support of the ICC and the ideals of international criminal justice uh, within uh, the domestic systems. So on the one hand, you have the political rhetoric of leaders castigating the ICC, and on the other hand, you have 
grounded support for the ICC and the ideals of criminal, international criminal justice grounded in domestic uh, institutions. So whereas in their collective African leaders have condemned the ICC and are actively seeking ways of curtailing its authority to deal with power po powerful political figures across the continent, their desire to disengage uh, from the treaty will probably be very difficult to attain. And that, that is my view. Now, let me sketch out uh, broadly why I say so. Uh, it is important to note that the factors which make the intent to disengage from the ICC uh, difficult to fulfill resonates with just about everything problematic in Africa's relationship with the international system. So, for example, the dependency on, on developed north eliminates the possibility of the continent or the countries in the continent charting an independent path in dealing with impunity. Uh, and this is far from the ideals of multilateralism ensconced in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, so I make the argument that this dependency makes it difficult for them uh, to make an independent judgment on whether or not they should dis disengage from the treaty. The other is the apparent inability of the African states in their collective uh, to influence governance beyond the continent. And th this is becoming very apparent with the African Union, uh, perhaps not a factor that is um, within their control, but they, they are completely uh, unable to influence international governance. Our Africans do not have a voice uh, in the management of international uh, affairs. Now, uh, th this factor is largely contingent on the paucity of resources, the fact that they do not have uh, money, and their propensity to seek uh, short-term fixes to the problems that they have. They, they do not plan long-term. Most African states do not plan long-term, uh, and, and, and they look for, uh, for immediate solutions to problems, uh, some of which have been around for a long time, and which require much more planning. Other than that, there is diversity and uh, the impracticability of all the 53 states in the continent speaking with one voice on any one issue. And we have seen this even with relation to ICC. African countries cannot speak with one voice. It has become almost uh, impossible to get uh, countries to speak with one voice. So even when they are acting within the umbrella organization, which is the African Union, uh, it is still impossible for them to come up with uh, a single voice on any one issue. Now, but the factor that I would like uh, to invite you to consider, and which in my view has become uh, very important lately, uh, is, um, is that um, there is clear manifestation uh, that um, the internal systems uh, do accommodate uh, inter principles of international criminal justice. And uh, there is great support amongst domestic legal institutions and non-legal institutions uh, of the ICC. Now, this is something that we don't hear about because we pay too much attention to the rhetoric uh, of political leaders. Now, some might question why I focus on international, on domestic institutions uh, when we know that uh, in Africa, political elites have been able to manipulate some of these institutions uh, to secure their own positions. Now, but in my view, the trend is emerging, especially in countries where there has been new, uh, um, uh, there has been new constitutions written, like South Africa, uh, like Kenya. A trend is emerging where the role of international law and its, its institutions are becoming uh, considerably strength, uh, strengthened. Uh, if you look at the South African Bill of Rights, uh, you see an extensive um, a guarantee of rights that you don't see in many other constitutions. The 2010 Kenyan constitution similarly have uh, uh, these uh, guarantees um, uh, entrenched. Now, this has enabled uh, domestic institutions in these countries um, to uh, imbibe international standards in a variety of ways that make elite manipulation of them um, so much visible and somewhat problematic. So whenever there is an attempt to manipulate these domestic institutions within uh, the framework of new constitutions, uh, such manipulation becomes very manifest uh, and therefore problematic. 
So as differences arise between the political elite and international bodies, such as the current uh, problems between states and the ICC, domestic institutions uh, that foster international standards have proven capable of providing some latitude for, for mediating the differences uh, between states and these international institutions. And what has become evident is that the infrastructure and modes of operation of these institutions are continually making it difficult for these leaders to align their anti-ICC rhetoric with national standards and aspirations. Now, in my view, therefore, making assumptions about Africa's relationship with the ICC based solely on the rhetoric of political leaders, um, and what I refer to as the tantrums of the African Union, because in my view, African Union is a very ineffective organization, uh, may be less useful uh, than eliciting insights on how modern institutions that function within the constraints of political power may become key to ending impunity in the continent. Now, I interrogate this view by setting out two broad uh, parameters of assessing uh, the apparent uh, relationship and contradictions between external policy of governments and the influence of these domestic legal structures, uh, mainly as far as the ICC is concerned, uh, and I use the Kenyan example in this in this case, and, and this study could, uh, some of these principles could readily be applied in the case of South Africa, uh, and you know what is going on there uh, lately. Now, so the first is by evaluating the successes or otherwise of the efforts to disengage, because there has been efforts to disengage from the ICC treaty, um, and secondly is by highlighting the points of convergence of ideas um, and roles between the ICC on the one hand and domestic legal institutions on the other. Now, apart from these two parameters, of course, uh, students of international law may also point to the, uh, the idea that uh, the role of African states um, as members of the international community, uh, thereby affirming and forecasting the possibilities that, they, that may inure for them to maintain a continued relationship with the international system, uh, will depend, of course, on the choices that they make. Uh, but, but that is a debate that uh, I, wouldn't, I, would, I won't go into now. Now, so let's, let's first look at the methods that, that these countries have, have used, uh, the uh, ways in which they have sought to disengage uh, from the ICC so that we can make an assessment uh, as to whether, uh, compared to uh, the ways in which the aspirations of the ICC links, or um, is the, um, uh, the aspirations of the ICC and the international criminal system is, is supported by domestic institutions, um, let's um, look at what, they, what, what countries have done. W what is it that the, the, the states have done uh, in the African continent to attempt to disengage uh, from the ICC? Now, you know that Africa was the greatest supporter of ICC uh, before and after it was immediately uh, uh, established. But while that is the case, Africa now is its uh, greatest critic. Um, so what has happened in the interim? Why, why is that the case? Now, one commentator has suggested that the reason for the change is rooted in Africa's ambivalence to international normativity, often reflected in its inability to translate global standards uh, of governance into actual domestic practice. And uh, one could point to the recent al-Bashir uh, debacle in South Africa, um, which means that um, the Africa's... Um, unhappiness with the ICC uh, should be viewed in the wider context of the shift from politics to law. I've written about this uh, in my previous uh, uh, papers. Now, on the other hand, uh, some people could view the Africa's change of heart to be a reflection of its reawakening uh, and therefore assertiveness in addressing the weaknesses in the international system. I don't know how many people would share this view. Uh, although doubtful, this view seems to, to rekindle the old memories of the 1960s when a vibrant Africa entering the UN, sh uh, uh, ship, uh, entering the UN shaped uh, international governance. And, and this is true for uh, those who follow the development in the, in the UN. Now, currently, Africa's uh, influence is minimal, and there are only a handful of issues on which its voice is heard. Even questions of reform of the UN Security Council, which has been uh, AU's pet subject for a long time, uh, is far from being 
realized. So today, however, from the perspective of many African leaders, the IC's involvement in Sudan has come to reflect their central concern about the UN, that it is not an organization that reflects uh, their aspirations. The skewed nature of power distribution within the UN Security Council and the global politics. So, that, that, so Africa is now premising, uh, basing its criticisms of ICC uh, based on their understanding of a skewed international uh, system. Now, because of the UN Security Council's legitimacy deficit, uh, many African and other developing countries see its work as cynical exercise of authority by great powers, uh, in particular the five permanent uh, uh, members. Now, the, of course, they uh, refer to UN Security Council's um, uh, inability to engage with the African states uh, with regard to Article 16 of the statute, uh, when African states have sought uh, the UN Security Council to suspend uh, uh, investigations by the ICC because the UN Security Council does have that, those powers. Now, undoubtedly, these two contending views play out rather critically in the review of Africa's relationship uh, with the international system uh, and may indeed influence the manner in which the international community responds to the tension between the African Union uh, and the ICC. It should be noted, though, that, the mapping, that mapping the interactions between the international criminal justice system and the African states and finding solutions to this uh, may require more sophisticated inquiry uh, than simply um, postering the current um, uh, political empty, empty political rhetoric by African uh, leaders. Now, the other factor that could premise this discussion um, is you will recall that uh, the ICC was established out of, outside the UN Security Council framework to, to promote the international rule of law uh, by institutionalizing checks on abuse of power and holding, accountable, uh, holding leaders accountable uh, for international crimes without undue in interference of politics. Now it had nothing to do with political compromises or readjustments of geopolitical power. So unlike its predecessor, the ICTY and the ICTR, uh, the, permanent, the permanency of the ICC was supposed to be immune from what was uh, then um, called the uh, victor's justice. The court was established uh, and designed with a noble universal purpose. Africa's participation in its establishment thus signified a watershed moment in the fight against impunity, given that the aberrations that promoted the establishment of the court had greater endurance in Africa. It was a strong statement of international rule of law. Given this, this history, what is happening now is somewhat uh, anti-climax uh, to the progressive aspirations of the past. That's, that's, the, that's the efforts to withdraw from the ICC treaty and disengage from the international criminal justice processes uh, that do not respect immunity of state, uh, whether motivated by ambivalence of African states to global standards of governance or the genuine need for reform of international institutions may eventually undermine the progress the international community has made uh, towards um, eradicating immunity and promoting the international rule of law. So no matter how you look at it, undermining the, uh, the work of the ICC in the continent uh, will have the effect uh, of undermining the promotion of international rule of law. Now the efforts to disengage have occurred at two levels, the continental level and at the national level. Now, movements towards this end only began after ICC uh, moved against the African heads of state. Uh, that is significant. So, it may also be worthwhile to mention that the indictment of uh, President Omar al-Bashir in 2005 on charges of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and um, the issuance of warrant of arrest against him marked the beginning of the contest between African states uh, and the ICC. Now there has been subsequent indictments that have also raised problems, that of uh, Kenyatta, the president of Kenya and his deputy, and four other high-ranking government officials, 
uh, which also was uh, highly contested by uh, the African states. And so therefore the, the African governments looked at the ICC as um, um, they accused it of um, ignoring international uh, law, principles of immunity, and failing to interpret its mandate uh, in accordance with the international law. Now, a lot has happened since 2005, but what is pertinently clear is that African states and the African Union have been so outraged by these situations that they have made various efforts to disengage uh, from the ICC. Now, AU has taken the lead um, as a collective organization uh, towards um, uh, these efforts to disengage uh, from the ICC treaty. Now, one way in which the AU has encouraged um, uh, disengagement is uh, uh, one way in which it has sought to disengage uh, its member states from the ICC is by encouraging uh, and advocating non-cooperation. So the AU, um, uh, this, this first emerged in 2009, when at an AU summit in Libya, uh, the organization directed its members to withhold cooperation with the ICC and not to comply with the obligations to arrest and surrender Omar al-Bashir. Uh, it also refused at that meeting to grant the ICC, um, um, to grant it permission or to accept that the ICC should open a liaison office uh, in Addis Ababa to facilitate interactions because there were discussions within the ICC that perhaps if there was an office in African, Ed African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, uh, then the tensions that were emerging could be discussed and mediated. Uh, but the AU completely shut that door in Libya and said, we don't want you near us. We, we don't want you in Addis Ababa. Now, uh, you will recall that the duty to cooperate is uh, key to the attainment of the objectives of the ICC treaty. This is because ICC has no enforcement mechanisms, uh, and it often uh, does so through the cooperation of, its, of, uh, of the members. So by urging its members not to cooperate with the ICC, the, I the AU was um, disengaging or uh, urging its members not to cooperate with the ICC. Uh, it was technically uh, and, and subtly uh, uh, asking members to disengage uh, from, uh, from the treaty. Now you know the provisions of Article 86 to 87 of the ICC treaty, um, the, where cooperation is required in respect of investigations and prosecutions. So the court may submit a request to the member states um, uh, to surrender a person, um, and um, the court is also mandated to enter into an arrangement with the state regarding the transportation of that person to the Hague. Now, there's a whole list of um, provisions that do spell out how states should cooperate with the, uh, with the court to ensure that the objectives of the treaty uh, are met. Now, but look at what happened after uh, 2009. Bashir is indicted by the court. Uh, but in 2010, Bashir visits Chad. Now, he visits Chad and remained in the territory for three days, was not arrested. Chad is a member to the Rome Statute. And um, despite request by the ICC that Chad should arrest Bashir, they did not do so. A lot of pressure from the European Union, uh, a lot of pressure from uh, other countries, uh, and also international NGOs for Bashir to be arrested while in Chad uh, was not honored. In 2010, Bashir visits Kenya, and the Kenyan government did not arrest Bashir, despite the fact that, that Kenya is a member of the ICC treaty, and despite requests being made by the ICC that Bashir should be uh, arrested. I, I remember he was in Kenya for only one day, uh, but he was there nonetheless. Now, the ICC um, reported Kenya to the UN Security Council um, and the Assembly of States Parties. Um, and um, that is almost all what was done in that respect. Now, Bashir made another attempt to visit Kenya. 
And um, this was not successful because uh, NGO groups moved to court uh, and, and started making noise about it. So, and the venue of the meeting that was bringing him to Kenya was changed. Most recently, Bashir visited South Africa uh, a few weeks uh, ago. Uh, and some people in the audience are shaking their heads uh, because they know the story. Um, the South African government, South Africa is a member of the ICC treaty. They are under an obligation to arrest Bashir. So despite requests, they declined to do so. And in the South African case, um, the civil society groups went to court, and court issued an order for Bashir to be arrested. And the government completely ignored that court order uh, and did not arrest uh, Bashir. Now, despite the same, same government making commitments about four or five years ago that they would arrest Bashir, uh, in line with their international obligations if he ever set foot in the country. Well, five years after that, he sets foot in the country uh, and the government does not arrest him. So in directing states not to cooperate with the ICC, the AU has relied on Article 98, and uh, you're familiar with the controversy on this article, uh, because of... Um, uh, because... Uh, because um, um, the Rome Statute excuses states uh, from the duty to cooperate uh, based on their international obligations. Um, and, um, but there are still questions um, regarding uh, the, whether the call by AU is consistent with obligations of state party uh, under the statute. Now, there are some AU members that have completely disagreed with this uh, position taken by the African Union, notably Botswana. Now, Botswana said after the CETA discussion, the Libyan discussion, that it will not associate itself uh, with any decision or calls being made for her to disregard uh, her obligations uh, to the International Criminal Court. And Botswana has remained very steadfast in, in this regard. So one way in which um, the AU has sought to disengage is through the call by its members to not to cooperate with the court. Uh, but even this is not being very successful because some countries uh, are already, like Botswana, are already saying that they will not do so. Now, the other way in which the AU has encouraged um, its members uh, to disengage uh, is by creating alternative institutions. And this is a talk now within the AU circles. Now, the, the AU's intention is to move the African states from the purview of international institutions altogether so that uh, most the AU states can only be subject, the member states can only be subject to institutions under its control. Now, this pattern is emerging in AU's response to various situations under, currently under investigation. In Sudan, the AU has supported the establishment of a hybrid court for Darfur. Um, this was, of course, ridiculous, um, given that the ICC uh, had been established as particularly for that purpose. Uh, in Kenya, too, the African Union has encouraged the, uh, or endorsed the establishment of a local tribunal uh, to deal with the cases uh, arising out of the post-election violence of 2008. And uh, you know that this was completely rejected by members of parliament because uh, there was a feeling at the time that it was a political move. Uh, but the AU now has come back. And uh, when before the case against President Kenyatta and his deputy, uh, uh, when the case had just begun, the AU came back and insisted that Kenya should establish um, one of its bargaining uh, points was that Kenya is capable of establishing a local tribunal and therefore ICC should have nothing uh, to do with its, its leaders. Now, sensing that the international community is not quite um, amused by the establishment of hybrid um, or local institutions or relying on, on these institutions, um, the AU has now moved to establish an alternative court to the ICC, which has a continental uh, blessing. Now, the, the meeting in July uh, 2009 did not only prohibit member states from 
um, cooperating with the ICC, but it also sought to enlarge the jurisdiction of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights and to empower it uh, to try serious crimes of international concern such as genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, which would be complementary uh, to national jurisdiction and processes for fighting impunity. Now, the African Court of Justice and Human Rights was established by a protocol um, which, uh, strangely, has not been ratified by African states. So uh, they are seeking to um, uh, enlarge the jurisdiction of a court which is established by a protocol that has not been ratified. Um, uh, very strange. Um, the <laughs> In, um, recently in Malabo, at its 17th ordinary session, uh, the AU still expressed its displeasure with the ICC involvement in Sudan and um, affirmed its position with regard to establishment uh, of this court. And um, pursuant to those directives, uh, a group of experts sat together uh, and drafted a protocol for this new court. So there is a protocol which is sitting with the members which has not been ratified. Now a new protocol was created, was drafted, uh, to give this court, whose protocol has not been ratified, uh, criminal jurisdiction. Uh, it's, it saddens me that one of my students was the lead um, expert uh, in the drafting of this protocol. Now, the protocol has since been adopted, uh, and it is really a strange document. Uh, those who have looked at the Malabo Protocol will, will, will agree with me. It has very problematic provisions. Uh, not, a, not, not, not the fact that its legality may be questioned in view of the fact that the court that it seeks to enforce has not been supported, uh, but it has certain inherent difficulties. Uh, first of all, um, the supporters of this protocol uh, argue that uh, it wasn't for the reason that the ICC had indicted Bashir and Uhuru Kenyatta that the African Union is establishing the court, but because there has always been this content with the principle of universal jurisdiction. Uh, they are saying that um, the fact that African leaders are being arrested in Europe, uh, some of them are arrested when they go shopping, um, and um, they are being humiliated um, uh, on the basis of universal jurisdiction uh, is causing a lot of discontent. And there has always been a move to redefine what universal jurisdiction should mean. But other than that, um, the draft of the protocol um, ignore the problems of bloated jurisdiction of the court and capacity, uh, all which will impede uh, the discharge of the court's dual mandate, because the court will be uh, dealing with human rights violations on the one hand, and also dealing with um, uh, criminal matters on, on the other. That was not well thought out. Secondly, uh, there is the resource issues. Who is going to fund this court? Uh, we know that most of the African Union operations are funded by the European Union. Um, uh, so where are Africans, African states going to get money uh, to put this court together other than through uh, donor funding? Uh, where will the money come from? Thirdly, there is no indication that the drafters anticipated the logistical problems of investigations, uh, prosecutions, and even detention of our suspects. And, and one, one posits this as a problem if you look at what is happening with the SADAC tribunal, for example. Uh, simply because Sadak Tribunal uh, had a case against Mugabe um, resulting from uh, his um, arbitrary acquisition of farms, and that led to the complete shutdown of the tribunal. Uh, one wonders whether the drafters of the protocol had uh, thought about this and placed certain uh, procedure, uh, safeguards that will ensure that the court is not shut down uh, if it starts to give unpopular decisions. And how are investigations going to be done if the whole idea of cooperation with international tribunals is as problematic as I've just uh, stated? 
Thirdly, there is the issue of uh, how does this court relate to ICC? Um, are African states going to completely um, um, disengage from the ICC and submit to the jurisdiction of this new court? And what is going to be the relationship between the two? Because obviously, as I'm arguing, there is no possibility that African states are going to walk away from the ICC treaty anytime soon. So uh, apart from that, there is the major question of immunity, uh, heads of state immunity. Because under uh, section uh, Article 46B of the new protocol, African heads of state and government have been given complete immunity. Um, and this is really a very sad state of affairs because despite the progress that we made in the ICTY, the ICTR, and the individual criminal responsibility for uh, what we consider to be international crimes, now here is a court being established at this time uh, many, many years after Nuremberg and saying that there are certain people that will not be subject to uh, criminal accountability. And, and that section is, that provision is in this new, new protocol. And then, of course, there are all kinds of, of crimes that the protocol does contain which are completely impracticable, like um, uh, a crime of environmental abuse, uh, piracy, that those now, according to the African protocol, those now will become international crimes or regional crimes uh, for which you, you, uh, criminal responsibility will attach. And how that will play out is, uh, seems to be very uh, problematic. So my argument is that even with this new process that is sought to be established by the African Union, the pros prospects for completely disengaging from the ICC is not there. Uh, the court may be established, uh, but it's uh, um, because there is currently there is a lot of talk about it, and there isn't a uh, heads of state meeting in South Africa. Uh, the idea that this court should be established as quickly as possible was, was firmly discussed, and because the Bashir matter was on the agenda as well, uh, this matters, uh, there seems to be a movement towards uh, its establishment. But this might not be uh, the court that completely replaces uh, the ICC. So those are the continental efforts to disengage. There isn't really much in them except for political posturing uh, and um, attempts to... Um, uh, to negate the effect of international law by creating institutions that somewhat have a semblance of uh, collective support from regional organization. But when you look at them and the instruments that set them up, you see so much weakness in them. Uh, and you wonder whether uh, they can, in, in effect, uh, replace the ICC. Now, let's talk about national attempts. And here, I want to focus only on Kenya. Now, there has been two attempts by the Kenyan government to, to disengage uh, from the ICC. Um, the, the first attempt was in December 2010 and followed by another in 2013. Now, let me give you a little background to the Kenyan situation. Immediately after the post-election violence in, 2000, in December 2007, a commission of inquiry was established to investigate the violence and make recommendations for, for the future. Now, this commission recommended that a credible local regime for investigation and prosecution of those responsible for, for the violence that occurred, uh, human rights violation as well as possible war crimes, uh, be established uh, to try those people. Uh, it suggested uh, that if, if the... Uh, tribunal, a local tribunal was not established, uh, then the names of those uh, mostly responsible uh, should be handed over to the ICC for investigations. And um, such option um, was supported by the um, list of names, a sealed list of names that was given to Kofi Annan, uh, who was the chief negotiator of uh, the peace deal that resulted from the discussions thereafter. And uh, it was agreed that Hanan would hand over that list to the uh, OTP, the Office of, uh, uh, of the Prosecutor uh, of the ICC, and that um, uh, those people would be investigated for possible uh, prosecution for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, the suggestion that the local tribunal be set up was completely rejected by, by the legislator. Um, a bill was prepared and 
put before Parliament for discussion. Uh, and most of the people who've been indicted uh, by the court, who are subsequently indicted by the court, rejected that possibility uh, of the establishment of a local court, because then they were playing politics, thinking that the court would be used against them. Now, the, at that point, there was a coalition government between uh, Kibaki and the leader of the opposition, and both the government and the opposition uh, were supporting and the establishment of the local tribunal, because I think from the government's perspective, uh, it was a little problematic to allow ICC uh, to do any form of investigation in Kenya. But uh, the majority of legislators, legisla legislators did not see it that way. They thought it was a political gimmick by, by the government uh, to get them. So they completely rejected the suggestion for uh, a local um, court. The so, with no local tribunal, uh, Kofi Annan handed over the list that was given to him to the ICC for investigation. And um, those familiar with uh, Moreno Campo and his uh, gang ho style, uh, he immediately announced that um, Kenya was under investigation. And uh, when he did so, is when now politicians became aware that there was a real possibility that they would be taken to The Hague. Now, you know the names of those who are in that list. It included the current president. By that time, he was not president yet. Now, in March 2010, the pretrial chamber of the ICC authorized the prosecution to begin, uh, um, authorized the prosecutor to begin investigations of the violence and um, the prosecutor announced, uh, I remember him uh, coming to Nairobi to announce uh, that uh, uh, investigations uh, had begun. And uh, Mr. Ocampo likes a little bit of fanfare, uh, so he, he came with a whole entourage from the ICC to announce in Nairobi that uh, these six people were now under investigation. Now, the, immediately thereafter, the politicians now realized that uh, perhaps they needed to have set up a local tribunal. And uh, there was a lot of discussion at that point, um, castigating the ICC, uh, blaming it for being an imperialist agent and undermining Kenya's sovereignty, uh, and so on and so forth. So they hurriedly brought in a motion in parliament uh, to withdraw Kenya from the ICC. And um, one of uh, the components of this motion uh, was a friend to the current deputy president, uh, William Ruto. Now, the motion was hurriedly passed with hardly any debate other than just uh, rhetoric about how bad the ICC is and how Kenya's sovereignty should be um, respected. Now, the, but that was now towards the end of the coalition government's uh, uh, period, and elections were now coming. And um, what happened... Um, the ICC process, meanwhile, proceeded, and these people are invited to The Hague, uh, and people now began to realize that the politicians were going to be tried by the Rome uh, court, and, now, uh, and, po and, and elections were now drawing uh, much closer. Now, in 2011, in March 2011, the ICC summoned the accused persons, Uhuru Kenyatta, William Ruto, and the rest of them, to to appear before it for confirmation hearing. Um, and um, at this point now, um, the politicians now began to actively pursue uh, the, uh, the objective of withdrawing Kenya from the treaty. And I remember at that time there were lots of discussion in political circles about how bad ICC was. And I happened to have um, attended a conference with Fatou Badin Suda at the time and, um, and took a picture with them and um, posted it. And some relatives um, wrote to me saying, hey, why are you posting your picture with uh, a person who is completely like, what good is this country? Uh, what's wrong with you? Um, and um, uh, while well, I'm working in South Africa, so, uh, but relatives said, how about us? You, you're working in Johannesburg, but how about us? We're living in Kenya. Uh, you're creating uh, problems for us because the atmosphere then was very tense, um, completely against the ICC, especially from the political, uh, political circles. Uh, but with uh, polls 
uh, ordinary people were supporting the ICC process because there was nothing being done about uh, redressing the, the violence and the, and the violations that had occurred. Um, and people saw the ICC as the only way in which people could be held to account. And then elections came, and Uhuru Kenyatta won the election as president, and his deputy was William Ruto. In fact, they rallied their campaign around the ICC factor uh, and was able to mobilize people and um, uh, to do all sorts of things during election uh, and to ensure that they were elected because there was no way they were going to let anybody win the election with them facing uh, charges at the Hague. That was not going to happen. Because if it did, then it meant that they were going to face, the new government was going to support the ICC and they were going to be probably convicted. So there was no way the duo was going to let the elections pass. And remember, most of the areas in which there was violence was William Ruto's home. And um, he comes from the Kalenjin group, and it was the Kalenjins who were visited a lot of violence on the Kikuyu, who are the Uhuru group. So it was quite bewildering that two parties that had really fought each other during the election, uh, during the post-election violence, actually came together uh, during the election. Um, and so they won the election, and immediately they won. Uh, then there was another motion brought to Parliament for withdrawal um, from the ICC. Now, that was in 2013. Now, this motion, too, was passed. Remember, the 2010 motion was passed. Nothing happened. The government didn't take any steps to withdraw. Um, now, there is a new motion again. The motion was passed, but there was nothing done about it, um, apart from political rhetoric, that we have an elected president. How can he be subject to, to a, a court or criminal investigation um, in a court which is sitting in Europe? Now, despite these motions, nothing has been done. Uh, there has been no effort to remove the country from the treaty um, in uh, using the procedure set out in uh, Article 127 of the Rome Statute because there's a procedure for withdrawal. The government has not attempted to use that procedure at all. So it's more political rhetoric that we are going to withdraw, we are going to withdraw, but there is no notice being issued as required by the statute uh, for such uh, withdrawal. So whereas... In political circles, um, leaders are talking about withdrawal, but doing the actual process that is required by law and set out in the treaty so that they can withdraw is not being done. So there is, there is that imbalance, and there must be a reason why they don't want to withdraw, but they want to withdraw. So um, maybe just playing a political, uh, a political game. So that brings me to the next level of my analysis. At least in Kenya, it is clear. It's clearly the case that there are domestic institutions which goals are consistent with the goals of the international criminal justice system, and that some of these institutions have a blessing of the new Kenyan constitution. Because what is it that is holding the government from actually taking steps uh, to withdraw when it, uh, when it clearly wants to do so? Uh, in this regard, one can conclude that there is some level of compatibility between these domestic institutions that are holding the fort uh, and, of course, the uh, International uh, Criminal Court. Now, this may appear to be contrary to the narratives um, we commonly hear from our politicians, uh, and uh, the narratives may simply have created a false impression that there is nothing in the Rome Statutes that is compatible with African values, and that is completely wrong. Um, in Kenya, the ICC has been vilified as an in intrusive organization that does not respect African leaders, and which has nothing to offer Kenyans by way of improving political governance and administration of justice. Now, this claim is completely false. Um, I want to support my view uh, by looking at what uh, these domestic institutions have done and how the new, uh, the new constitution has positioned these institutions in such a way that they support the work of and standards of international criminal justice. Now, Kenya ratified the Rome Statute in 2005 um, at the height of, uh, uh, of uh, the period that Moi government was, uh, was falling apart. Now, in doing so, it moved closer to adopting international standards in dealing with impunity, while at the same time galvanizing its methods uh, of dealing with international crimes. 
Now, following the uh, enactment of the new constitution in 2010, uh, some of these uh, aspirations and standards have now been solidified. Um, the constitution um, has established uh, legal and administrative frameworks uh, that support the implementation, its implementation in a number of ways. And some of these ways have positively affected uh, the manner in which uh, international crimes, uh, international criminal justice standards are being implemented. Now, first of all, let's look at the new constitutional framework. Um, it affirms Kenya's compatibility with, of its legal system with the ICC. Uh, first of all, um, it allows all treaties that have been ratified by Kenya to become part of domestic law. It has removed that former bottleneck where um, a treaty needed to have been discussed in parliament and uh, uh, even if it has been ratified and for parliament to give express permission that the courts can apply those standards, that has been removed by the new uh, constitution. Now, so long as a country ratifies a treaty, the treaty automatically becomes part of domestic law, which I'm, I'm sure people in this country would find uh, very interesting. Now, this is um, quite radical, because what it means now is that there's a, a host of domestic law that we probably don't even know about, because they are now contained in, uh, in various treaties. Now, secondly, there is an express domestication of the ICC treaty. Now, ICC treaty is now part of Kenya's law uh, by virtue of the enactment of the International Crimes Act of 2009. Now, this act simply uh, reenacts all the crimes under the treaty into, into domestic law. Now, there, there are also principles of, um, of uh, international law that have also been enacted in the new act. Um, spelling out the crimes that are applicable uh, and also the principles of complementarity have now been affirmed by uh, the, new, uh, the new act. Now the act also establishes methods of cooperation with the ICC in various ways, um, as a helping with the arrest and surrender of suspects if they're in Kenyan territory, um, uh, allowing the Kenyan High Court to issue warrant of arrest against person who is being looked for by who the ACC is seeking, um, and um, creating all those mechanisms that are provided for in uh, in the treaty uh, for uh, assistance of domestic of assistance of the ICC uh, by domestic uh, courts. Now, uh, this act has been tested by. Um, by the court um, in uh, a case arising out of the threat by al-Bashir to visit Kenya for the second time, uh, the Kenyan section of the uh, ICJ, the International Commission of Juries, went to court and asked the High Court to enforce its obligations under Section 4 of the Act, which allows the High Court to issue warrants of arrest. And uh, the court did agree with that application and issue a warrant of arrest. So technically what the court was saying was that if Bashir sets foot in Kenya, then he should be arrested. And a warrant of arrest was issued. Now the applicants to this court relied both on the constitution, which allows for direct application of international law, and also the um, International Crimes Act, which domesticates uh, the treaty. Now, the government argued against that application, um, stating that um, the ICC had not requested for any warrant of arrest to be issued. The government's interpretation was that uh, what that section requires is that there must be an express uh, request by the ICC for a warrant of arrest to be issued. And since there was no such request, then uh, the court has no business issuing a warrant of arrest. But the court, uh, the judge disagreed uh, with this view and proceeded uh, to issue a warrant of, uh, of arrest. Now, uh, uh, in the judge's view, the judgment is very interesting because in his view he indicated that the ICC treaty is now part of Kenya, uh, Kenyan law uh, and therefore uh, uh, the, uh, the request for warrant of arrest uh, must be supported. 
Now, of course, there are criticisms that have been leveled against the judgment uh, that I won't go into, but, but it does represent an indication of how domestic institutions, and similar to what has happened in South Africa just a few days ago, a few weeks ago, that domestic courts are willing to enforce the ICC uh, standards. Uh, and that uh, despite what politicians are saying, um, there is a willingness within the domestic structures to, um, to enforce uh, international uh, standards. Now, there are various other ways in which the implementation of the 2010 Constitution does support the ICC uh, that perhaps I won't go into, but there is uh, systems of judicial reform uh, that are currently going on that are affirming uh, the, 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 some of these standards which are contained uh, in the treaty. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me therefore to conclude uh, that um, uh, with a few remarks uh, regarding what, in my view, I think um, uh, is important in determining uh, or um, characterizing the relationship between the court uh, and African states. Firstly, there is no doubt that the future of uh, international criminal justice depends on how we strengthen domestic institutions, especially in Africa. Um, this, some of this, uh, this view was uh, articulated at, uh, in Chautauqua a few days ago, with the prosecutors acknowledging the importance of referring cases that have been brought to them to the domestic courts. And um, I was um, interested, I was quite fascinated to learn how the ICTY is referring certain course cases back to uh, Bosnia. Um, to be tried by domestic uh, institutions. So in my view, I think there is a lot to be said about the future uh, of the uh, international and ending impunity by strengthening a domestic courts. Now, and secondly, there is still a chance. Um, uh, there is still a chance for creating better relationship between the ICC and African states, uh, given that the ICC still enjoys uh, some measure of support by this domestic institution. But the ICC must play its part too, because there, there are certain issues that have arisen with regard to the way cases are managed uh, and how decisions are made regarding indictments that may be problematic. Uh, but um, so uh, what could be suggested is that the, the office of the prosecutor must now begin to devise more creative ways uh, of uh, executing its mandate. Um, um, and also responding uh, much more vigorously to the accusation that it is only targeting African states, uh, because whereas because they're, they're, uh, all the cases now are from Africa, and that raises a perception that the court is only dealing with cases from Africa. So uh, the OTP needs to devise more creative ways of responding uh, to these issues. And um, given that um, the uh, the office is mandated under Article 53. Um, uh, to pursue broader goals uh, of peace, justice, and, uh, and in a manner that is consistent with the execution of its mandate, um, the court should allow for more um, uh, collaboration with like-minded institutions uh, within the domestic setup. Uh, s uh, and you know what happened in Libya, the, the, the dilemma of whether a domestic institution should be let to to deal with the, with the Libyan case, uh, knowing very well what the outcome might be, or whether the ICC should, should actually take over. So th those issues uh, should be resolved by the, uh, by, by the office of the prosecutor. And lastly, uh, those, who, uh, many, those of us who are interested in this matter should reflect on the legacy of the Kenyan cases. Um, because some people have argued that with the termination of the um, trial of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, perhaps the ICC has suffered a very, very heavy blow. And whether it can recover from that blow uh, is something that we need, we need to reflect on. But my view uh, is that um, there's still room for strengthening these relationships uh, and making the ICC work. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think when we debate these issues, we should also consider the plight of the victims. There, were m there are many people around the world whose only hope uh, is um, an international uh, institution. There are many, many people in this world, and especially in Africa, if you consider the, the thousands that were killed in Darfur, that nobody is speaking about and when we debate these issues. We must remember that there are people who lost uh, loved ones, there are people who were maimed, killed, displaced, who nobody is speaking on behalf of. So 
when we consider the future of such an important organization, we should also consider the, uh, the plight of, of the victim. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I want to know, uh, how do you think uh, with the, the migrants crossing over into like a lot of the European countries, how does that play a role into the issue with ICC? Hope that's not too loaded of a question. Do you want me to, you want to take a few or would you like me to respond? Uh, if the well there is there is um, the, the the fact that um, there is not anybody doing something about uh, situations that are getting out of hand and states that are collapsing uh, points to the wider failure of the international community uh, Many people should have done something about Syria, for example, when there was an opportunity to do so. And we just didn't do anything. And um, now what we, we now have is um, a state that is collapsing with uh, thousands of people who have nowhere to go, uh, poor governance, and a completely uh, situation that has run out of control. Um, but my, my fear, though, is that um, this is going to have an impact on um, in a lot of negative impact in Europe because you are having a massive group of people entering countries. Um, and uh, I notice in all the news that the, the Europeans are not referring to them as refugees, but referring to them as migrants, uh, which means that the Europeans are careful uh, that they do not want uh, the obligations of the refugee convention uh, to apply in those cases, which would mean that they must not return them to where they are coming from, and several other uh, obligations that arise from the convention. So they are being referred to as migrants and, and not refugees. Uh, but this points to a wider failure of our communities, um, of the international community in my view. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how it's going to impact on the work of the ICC, uh, but it certainly does indicate that um, institutions that we have um, could probably be strengthened to ensure that uh, governance does not fall uh, to the level that we now have, uh, where people are simply um, do not want the democratic processes. Uh, in Africa now we have leaders saying that they want to have terms beyond those allowed by the constitution, and we are just looking at it. Look at Burundi, for example. Um, a person is told that the, the leader has already done his two terms, but he says he will contest nevertheless, since people are saying, all what the African Union is saying, don't do it, but he does it, and now he has declared himself president. And uh, there are so many people suffering, so many people have been killed, but nobody really seems to take seriously these obligations. Uh, and so when I hear the political leaders in Africa talking about ICC being an imperialist court, I ask the question, but you are members of this treaty. Uh, you belong to the assembly of state parties. If the ICC is, 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 is not functioning, why don't you fix it? You are the members, you've signed the treaties, you sit down to review its functions every few years, why don't you fix it? They don't want to fix it. Uh, instead, they would like to have the institution there, but not touching them, and them continuing to, to violate every other principle um, that is acceptable of governance. Uh, I see the Syrian case as um, really a major indictment to the international community and failure to do something about a situation that is clearly deteriorating and causing so much human, human suffering. Um, but as to its relationship with the ICC, I'm not quite sure that we can draw parallels. But we, we can certainly see that the, the whole idea of ending impunity is, is an important factor that we probably should take much more seriously than we've done in the past. Fessa. Um, so we all know there's a lot of corruption in Afghan politics and in the criminal justice system that you were talking about. Can you compare that to like what's happening in America, if you can? 
could you just clarify what's happening? Well, the criminal justice system compared to like what's going on in America and what's going on in Africa. Uh, I can't make the comparison. If there's any similarities. Yeah, because I'm not quite sure of what's happening here. <laughs> but, but, but there are outrageous things happening in Africa um, that um, offend every sensibility of a right-thinking person. Um, there are certain things that are completely outrageous. Um, for example, corruption that does not allow any system to function. Um, the biggest corruption in South Africa, where the court issues an order, but the government does just does nothing about it. Um, I don't know what happens in this country. Can a court issue an order and the government just ignore it? Like the Supreme Court gives an order and the White House just says no? Can it? Uh, uh, l l let me ask you another stark example. Can um, your president simply take 246 million US dollars to build his own house? And people would say, no, that's OK. And parliament would refuse to impeach him. Would it happen? So, they're, they're <laughs> so all I'm saying is. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are outrageous things that happen uh, in the continent. So when the, those leaders, when those, those same leaders, uh, you know, the, the chairperson of the African Union is a gentleman called Robert Mugabe. So when we, when we talk about African Union doing ABCD, we are saying that Robert Mugabe is leading an organization to do these things. Now, and look at the other people who sit in that organization. Uh, are, are, are they really people who want to promote governance, respect human rights in their own countries. So th there's a lot that can be said about what needs to be fixed. And um, it is not the mistake of the ICC. Uh, it is the mistake of states. We don't cooperate as well as we should. Now, people point to the United States saying, well, but the United States, the bigger states have not ratified the treaty. And the greater portion of the world is not subject to the treaty. Because if you consider India, China, United States, those are not members of the ICC treaty. So the greater population of the world is outside <laughs> the ICC. But should that deny legitimacy? Uh, I don't know. I mean, this, these are issues that we can debate. Uh, should that deny legitimacy? Um, it's almost similar to you being stopped by a traffic cop and uh, being given a ticket and you, you tell the cop that, hey, the driver who just went before me was flying past me. Why didn't you stop him? Does that deny you the, deny the traffic cop the authority to issue you with a traffic ticket? Uh, so uh, 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 my, my response to these things is that why don't you push, put your house in order? And what are you doing about your victims? In Kenya, for example, a whole lot of women and children were in church. The door was locked and the church was torched. And people died there. So who is talking on behalf of these people? Who is going to seek justice for them? Look at Darfur. Millions were simply massacred. Millions were massacred. And when we talk about Darfur, the only person we talk about is Omar al-Bashir. But how about those thousands that were killed? Millions that were killed. And thousands that have been displaced. How about them? Shouldn't somebody do something about them? So, so my, I think that um, international lawyers and persons interested in international criminal justice have their work cut out for them. Not just in terms of assessing how states ratify these treaties, because if that is the only thing you're looking at, then you'd say the United States has no business talking about the ICC. But, but just w what kind of world do we want to have? And are we going to hold people accountable for the things, the outrageous things that they do? So that is, that is my perspective. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, hello. Um, I guess I understand why the governments of the individual states are against the ICC, but why is the African Union as a whole, like doesn't it, Aren't they giving their consent and being like, it's fine if our uh, member states act in, uh, uh, do the uh, 
Oh, okay. Really the things that they do. Yeah, the things that they do. Mm -hmm. Isn't it giving them, you know, uh, allowing them to do that if they, if the African Union w wishes to, as a whole, withdraw from the IPC? Yes. Well, the, the, the African Union is, is nothing other than those heads of state. Because remember, every other decision uh, that the African Union takes is those, those heads of state who sit together. It's the Mugabe's, Museveni's. They are the ones who make the ultimate decision. It is the heads of government, um, it's the president, the heads of states and government that make the ultimate decision. Let, let, let me give you an interesting story. There was a time that uh, the African Commission wanted to investigate Mugabe for human rights violation. So they sent a fact-finding mission to, to Harare. African Commission sending a fact-finding mission on allegations of human rights violation in Zimbabwe. So the fact-finding mission arrives there. And um, they talk to civil society groups. They ask to meet the government. The government refuses. Says, you're human rights uh, investigators. We are not going to meet you. So this group concludes its discussions with the civil society groups and prepares its report. The report is handed back to the African Union, to the heads of state. Now, the heads of state refuse to accept the report and to publish it on the basis that that fact-finding mission did not talk to government. Yet the government completely refused to talk to them. So, you see, the, the, there are certain things that the, Afri the African Union is nothing other than these heads of state. So what you see the African Union doing is what these heads of state are doing. So it's the Omar al-Bashir. They, they, the, they are the members of this organization. So how do you expect them then to, to support uh, their own arrest and accountability? It's difficult. Thank you very much.